All right, now to the second part, modern practice. Now, let me go over a little case study of um, a game that we've been working on over the last couple of weeks, OPCraft. You can actually check it out at opcraft.mat.dev if you want to. And it, like I said, it only consists of eight components and seven systems, so I'm actually gonna go over every single component right now on every single system and explain you how it works. Um, I'm just gonna go very quickly over the components and then explain them further when I explain the systems. So at first we have the item component, which is attached to item entities and basically tells you which type of block um, that, that entity is. Then we have the item prototype component, which is a slightly more advanced concept that I will go over in just a second. And we have the recipe component and the occurrence component, which are both attached to the item prototype entity. And then we have the owned by component, which tells you who owns a specific block, and it's attached to the, the item entity itself. Then we have the position component, which stores the position of a certain block, and it's also attached to the item itself. And then we have two more components, the stake component and the claim component, which are used for our chunk protection system. And I'm also gonna go over that in just a second. So now to the systems. We have the mine system. It's obviously very, very central in this game. Um, it acts on a couple of components, and basically what it does is it checks whether there actually is, so you send a coordinate to the contract and uh, a type of entity, and then what the system does is it checks whether there actually is a block of that type at that position, and if so, it removes the position component and instead adds the owned by component to that entity. Then we have the build system, which is basically the inverse of the mine system, and it checks whether you own the block that you're currently trying to place, and then removes the owned by component and instead uh, puts the position component on it. Then we have the craft system, which acts again on a couple of components. It checks whether the entities that you send to it are all owned by you, and then if the hash of those entities corresponds to the hash of a known recipe. And if so, it creates a new block and gives it to you. And finally, Oh, not finally, but then we have the stake and claim system. Those are two systems, but they work very closely together. With a stake system, you can stake diamonds in a chunk, and then with a claim system, you can claim that chunk for you if you have the highest stake in that chunk. And then somebody else can come and stake more and claim the chunk from you. Then we have the transfer system, which is very trivial. Uh, it just transfers, it changes the owned by component, transfers the block from your inventory to somebody else's in inventory. And now finally we have the occurrence system, which is not really a system because it doesn't act on any components. It just basically is a pure function, but we still use the system pattern in order to take advantage of the entire MUD infrastructure. And with that, you basically have an overview over the entire architecture of OPCraft. You could have totally done that yourself. It was not hard. Um, and now with two, uh, now I wanna talk about two little things that I find, uh, that I found interesting um, when building OPCraft. The first one is data versus code, and the second one is on-chain terrain generation. For the first part, data versus code. I just mentioned when you wanna add new content, you can modify component values or you can add new components. But every time you add a new component, you basically also have to add a new system because otherwise there's no logic that handles this component, right? Adding, in, adding a new system is basically adding new physics to this world. and um, whereas adding, like recombining components that you already have is just adding new content to the world. And you kind of want to optimize for only adding content to the, or not only, but you want to optimize for adding content to the world because it's easier to do than deploying a new system that then could have bugs and, and so on. So one example in OPCraft is the item component. We could have gone the easy way um, and just stored, like create a block type enum and then store that value inside of the item component in order to represent what type of item or what type of uh, block this item is. And then in our mind system and build system, et cetera, we would have had to hard code those, uh, this block enum and then check the occurrence of that block enum and uh, check the recipe, et cetera. What we did instead is create an item prototype component and then create item prototype entities. And then in the item component, we can just point to those item prototype entities instead of a hard coded value. And to this item prototype entity now, we can add components that are basically shared by all the grass entities as an example. And there are two components that we add to those item pro prototype entities that are uh, one, the occurrence component, which includes a function selector to a function that then tells you whether this block actually occurs at this position. And this is used in the mind system. 
And then we have the recipe, recipe component, which is also attached to uh, certain item prototype components, uh, item prototype entities. And it stores the hash of the entity types that you need to burn in, uh, essentially in order to create one of these uh, components. And now what that allows us to do is after the main systems have been deployed, we can just add new component values by creating a new uh, block, like item prototype entity, and attach a new recipe or occurrence component to it, and suddenly we have a new type of block that is still handled by all the existing, existing systems. And the second part that I found really interesting uh, when working on, on OPCraft is the on-chain terrain generation. Here are a couple, couple of images uh, of the beautiful on-chain terrain uh, that we're generating, in case you haven't seen it in the real game yet. And basically, I just told you that all the blocks in OPCraft are represented as entities with components attached to them. That is not completely true, because if you want to have an infinite procedurally generated world, then obviously you can't represent every single block as an entity um, in your ECS system or on-chain. What we do instead is we have a function, a closed form function of the entire world, essentially, that gives you, uh, for as an input, it takes in, as an input the coordinate of a block, and then as an output, it gives you the block at that position. And then what we do is just store the difference to this world in ECS. So every time you mine a block, we basically place an air entity at that position, and every time you build a block, we just place the block at that position. So how do you get this uh, closed form function um, that represents the entire terrain. Step one is you need Perlin noise. Um, Perlin noise is a noise function that was invented by Ken Perlin, and it's very useful to generate these kinds of infinite terrains. And so the first thing you need is basically a Perlin noise implementation in Solidity and a matching Perlin noise implementation on the client, ideally in WebAssembly, such that it is fast enough. And conveniently, Mud already gives that to us, so we don't have to do anything further. Um, and then you could theoretically just use the Perlin output as the height of your, uh, of your world, and now you already would have an infinitely uh, procedurally generated world, but it's not very interesting. So let's add uh, some more interesting stuff to it. Step one, uh, or like step three, I guess, is adding oceans. For that, we scale up the Perlin, and now we have huge valleys and huge uh, like oceans, basically. And we say every time, uh, like in our function, we say if the, if the height of the current block is less than zero, but it's above the height of the Perlin, then we put water there, and now we have oceans. But the terrain still looks pretty pretty boring, so next thing is adding uh, something called octaves, which is basically the same thing w as when you add uh, different sine curves with different frequencies and ampli amplitudes. Uh, like, if you, add them, uh, if you add them up, then you get like more interesting patterns, basically. You can do the same with Perlin noise, and if we do that twice with two different uh, octaves, then we get something like this, which is already much more interesting, but it still all kind of looks the same, so we can, we can do better. Next step, let's add some biomes. For biomes, we need basically two, two more uh, Perlin functions that we just for our own understanding call humidity and heat, and then for every point in the world, we can compute the Perlin value for this heat and humidity, and then plot it into this graph. And then in this graph, we uh, we like divide the graph into four quarters and say, if the heat is high and the humidity is low, then we're in a desert. If the heat is high and the humidity is high, then we're in a savanna, et cetera. And now, as I said, for every point, we get uh, like a, a point in this graph, essentially, and then we can compute the distance from these edges of the biome to get a biome vector. And then we can use this biome to say, like to in, in this case, just represent the block types in a different way, so such that you can see where the biomes are. But we can do more interesting stuff like uh, scaling the terrain depending on the biome, such that in a mountain, bi uh, in a mountain biome, you get like much higher terrain and, and like mountains, and in the savanna biome, you get much more flatland kind of things. Next step is adding valleys and rivers to make it again a little bit more interesting. And this is where something called a spline function comes into play, spline interpolation. We create the spline function, and then we create a new Perlin function, and don't use the Perlin value directly, but rather map it through this function into a new value. And in the case of rivers and valleys, we basically want um, not to use the, the like peaks and the, like the, the hills and the valleys of the Perlin function directly, but rather the, the areas of the Perlin function where it's like at the, at the like around 0 0.5, such that the output of that like mapped function is basically the thing you see here on the right. 
and then we just subscript, subtract that from the terrain we have uh, so far, and we get valleys and rivers. And now this looks already much more interesting, but it's still kind of naked. So let's add some plants. For plants, we can just hash the coordinate, the 2D coordinate basically, um, and then say if the coordinate, or if the hash modulo some value is below a certain threshold, then we put a plant there, otherwise not. And we can do the same for ores if we use the 3D hash of the coordinate. And then we get something like this, where you have at random positions plants growing. And now the final, the final touch that's still missing here is something that's bigger than just in like a, a small flower, a small plant, um, something like a tree. But for trees, it's slightly more tricky because a tree is not only at one specific coordinate, but rather it spans across like multiple coordinates. So the trick that we use here is basically use a structure, uh, like a, yeah, a structure grid, and align our structures on that grid, and then we can map each position, uh, like each individual tile coordinate to one of these uh, grid um, coordinates. And then we can use the same trick as before and use the hash of that structure grid uh, coordinate. And then if it's below a certain threshold, we say, okay, there's a structure at this position. And if we know there's a structure at this position, then within the structure, stru uh, within the structure grid, we can say, is, uh, we, we, can, we can figure out if there's a block of this type at this position within this struct, if that makes sense. And that's it, basically. Now we have a beautiful, infinitely generated terrain with uh, flowers and plants and ores and valleys and rivers. And this is basically all you need to know about OPCraft. Um, now you know where all the diamonds in OPCraft are, so you can mine all of them and build something cool. Thank you.